Was it Nikon? Or was it aliens who really created the Z9? After running an in-depth analysis, we're still not sure. We've reached out to this man for comment, but from his Instagram, it looks like he's currently in Miami, so it might be a little while before he gets back to us. I asked you here on YouTube and on Instagram what you wanted to know about the Nikon Z9, and here are the answers to your questions. We're here today with the all new Nikon Z or Z, depending on which country you're from, nine. I have been very impressed with this camera in the short time that I've had it. And today we're going to run through a variety of different tests here at our, our kitchen in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, test kitchen. The number one question that came up uh, a lot actually is about flash uh, and specifically high speed sync. So let's, uh, let's, let's do an example right here for real. This is the Godox V1 on a flash stick and the X2T controller. And uh, high speed sync, uh, I guess you can't see. Now you can see, is uh, one slash 8,000th of a second. And it's working. And if you are struggling to enable high speed sync in any of your Nikon cameras, head on over to the custom setting menu, go to E, bracketing and flash. This is in the case of the Nikon Z9 and uh, change your flash sync speed, which is the first option there. And there you have it, it works. It works very, very well. Uh, I would expect it to work because this is, at the end of the day, uh, th this is the flagship camera, so you're going to see this on the sidelines at a bunch of different sporting events and people tied into the, the, the strobes that are in the ceiling. So uh, yeah, check high-speed sync. Next question is about the autofocus and is the autofocus better than something like the Nikon Z6 II? And I will say, well, let's go to a shoot and, and you can watch. The 3D autofocus in this camera is incredible. I'll be doing a full video on that as well as other autofocus uh, settings uh, in the mountains, some snowboard content, a little faster moving. Uh, that will be coming in a couple of weeks. Right now I'm going to show you what Nikon has criticized the most for and how it is now fully operational and functional. When you're on full autofocus points, so you just kind of set to automatic mode, and you're looking for that IAF to pick up at a long distance. In the past, uh, it worked pretty well, but you definitely had to use some object tracking from time to time. Now I'm happy to say that I would be fully comfortable to just roll on this automatic points at a wedding and let the, the camera do its thing. I will also say that the Z series in the past has had a tendency to focus on the closest object to the uh, frame, even if it might not be what you want. And that does seem to be resolved in this camera. I'll obviously be testing that further. So as you can see, the autofocus is significantly better and I would definitely put it on par with something like the, the Canon R6 or R5 or even the Sony A1. Uh, it's really quite phenomenal. Oh, we got a train. With that sensational content out of the way, we can get back to talking about the camera. The next question we have is about size and weight. Uh, it is obviously a larger body. Does it weigh a lot? No. It, honestly, in comparison to something like the D6 or the D5 that I used extensively, uh, it's definitely smaller. And if you are, say for instance, if you're a wildlife shooter you're out there, it's no problem at all. If you're a wedding photographer and you're carrying this with you all day, uh, I would honestly have no problem with it. This, this is the, the 24 to 120, which is maybe not an ideal wedding lens. Um, but with this kit, let's see how, this is, this is a, a Z6 II. No, this one weighs more. Yeah, it definitely weighs more, but those 8Ks be heavy. Gareth Carr asks, does it fit inside an empty bag of Doritos? Not a, a single serving, but a family size body only. That would definitely fit inside a family size bag of Doritos. Cool ranch. Another thing we noticed uh, on the last question, thank you, Mr. Gareth Carr. Is it the, uh, the little protective? blades are down. Not shutter blades, because there's no shutter in this camera. But yeah, that's a nice thing. I don't know if I'm supposed to do that. BCAP, Brian Capricci asks, compare it to the Leica M10R. It's bigger. But the megapixels are similar. Another question that came up a lot is buffer tests. So what Nikon has done is they used to have a large, medium, and small uh, file size so that the megapixels would actually come down with each file. Uh, I used my Nikon D850 
primarily on medium size raw that I didn't need the full, I don't remember, 45 megapixels of that camera. I wanted something more like 24. I was happier with that. So Nikon has gotten rid of that and everything you're shooting is going to be the full 45 megapixel file. But what they've actually done in the raw recording settings here, they've added lossless compression, which is your full regular file size. And then high efficiency with a star, which gives you a file size that's two thirds, which is kind of roughly, I would say, a medium raw size. And then high efficiency, no star, which is one third the file size, which is a lot more like a small raw file. But with that, there's a squirrel looking at me. And what that basically is, is a small raw size, but you were getting the full megapixel. So you're getting the full 45 megapixel file just with less file size. So let's run through some tests. And as you can imagine, I would assume doing that style of compression probably slows the processor down a little bit, but the processor in this is amazing. So let's find out if you would reach a reasonable limit. All right, we're on lossless in the camera and I am now going to uh, just take a bunch of photos and, and you'll hear when it stops or keeps going. There you go. So that is lossless. Now moving on to high efficiency. So that one sustains. And now moving over into high efficiency, no star. So that is actually the opposite of what I thought. I figured lossless, even though it's more bytes, the camera's doing less. Um, so that actually kind of went in the opposite. So I'm kind of happy to hear that as somebody that's likely going to be shooting on this high efficiency star mode, that gives me more frames than I could ever possibly need. And kind of along with that test, as somebody that shoots both photo and video uh, at wedding days, um, I figure this test is important for both myself and also Liam, even if we are a test market of two, um, this, is, this is the test. So basically I'm going to take a bunch of photos. I am in high efficiency star mode, and then I'm gonna to switch to video and I'm going to see if I can just instantly be recording. And I'm going to be recording in video mode on, we'll set that first. We'll do 4K 60. So I'm taking a bunch of raw photos, switching into video mode and recording a 4K 60 clip. And we'll see how long that delay is. Um, and also for what it's worth, I know this camera does a alarming number of frames per second. At a wedding day, I don't think that I would ever be shooting 20 frames a second. I will run that test, but first we're gonna do a low frame rate test, switch, and then a high frame rate test and switch. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. We're in video mode. Three, two, one. Feel like that, like somebody's walking down the aisle, you're taking this many photos, and then all of a sudden they get to the end of the aisle and you wanna get a video clip, and you're instantly recording. So there is no buffer delay whatsoever there. Now let's do a high frame rate and see if that slows it down at all. One, two, three. So many photos of them coming down the aisle. And switch to video mode. And recording now. So there's about a one second delay whenever you shove 60 photos through the pipeline. Um, I would say that's kind of an unreasonable use case. I would say that the low frame rate is something that you would be a lot more likely to experience on a wedding day. And I would say that that keeps up quite beautifully. Next question, with a full electronic shutter, can you test out various lighting conditions? I don't have a light that can do many different frequencies, but what I can do is go to the most confusing lighting situation that I'm aware of, and that is a grocery store which for some reason they just want to use all the lights, including this weird UV slash black light over this section of the, the grocery store for some reason. I don't know. And well, I can't defend their decisions for these lighting choices, uh, what I can say is that this camera works incredibly well in all of them. And I would say that this, uh, with Nikon going to a full electronic shutter, this is one of the things that they would have had to pay the most attention to. If you're not familiar with electronic shutters, some of them have a tendency to create weird lines or banding where it should not be. Uh, this camera does not seem to suffer from that whatsoever. Picked up my Fresca, I'm heading home. And sorry for the trash compositions, but I'm just trying to show you the, the lights, not the, not the compositions. Tim wants to know how the voice memos sound they sound like this, Tim. When it comes to low light autofocus, it has been significantly improved. As you can see, there's pretty much no real light in this scene, and it's still identifying my eyeballs, uh, even though I'm not really visible on the, the LCD display. And here are some high ISO images, uh, 3200, 6400. I find that in a real life environment, I never really go above 8000 uh, ISO if I'm using the correct lens for the job. Uh, but here are some samples that are a little bit higher. 3,200 versus 20,000 ISO. 
And now a quick IBIS test in body image stabilization. I have been very happy with the Nikon Z series image stabilization for quite some time now. Uh, this is a lens without stabilization in it. So this uh, sample is IBIS only. And as you can see, uh, even with kind of some jerky movements, the footage stays together pretty well. Obviously best case don't ever do that in an actual clip you want to use. Um, but just as a demonstration, I'm sure if you've seen a lot of footage, you've tried to zoom, you've probably seen some pretty jello-y footage. This uh, holds together a lot better. Uh, I think with the subtraction of any rolling shutter, that helps out a lot as well as just really good quality um, IBIS as well. This is handheld at 120 millimeters. I'm not using a tripod or anything, just complete handhold. Uh, the I guess if you were to stack something like the 70 to 200 2.8 IS with the in-body stabilization, you'll be absolutely blown away with the fact that you can handhold um, at 200, no problem. But even with a teleconverter, uh, I feel like we were cropped into DX mode uh, with a two-time teleconverter and handholding at 600 millimeters, and it actually looked pretty dang good. All right, two last tests. How fast it switches to the EVF? Really quick, really natural and how fast the camera actually turns on. The boot time is very fast and uh, it's pretty, pretty quick. Turn it on, that's how fast it goes. And I guess to kind of close out my conclusions on, am I going to be shooting this camera on a wedding day? Um, I think that this is absolutely the best Nikon camera that's ever been made. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised. I was expecting that it would be maybe 80% up to my expectations, but quite honestly, they have thought of everything and put everything into this camera. You will not find the limit of what this camera will help you create, which is really, really cool. Um, and that goes far, it, it, it exceeds what I could ever really need from a camera as well. So I don't need 8K, I don't need 8K60, which will be coming in a firmware update um, as a regular user, but to have that functionality is kind of nice as a photographer and video creator that kind of does a, a wide variety of things. I like to have that expandability uh, while also the, the core features that I use every single day just working significantly better than I could ever expect. So uh, yeah, hats off to Nikon for creating this camera. I am super, super happy with it and uh, I'm excited to get my hands on one. Over the winter, there will be a number of videos coming to you on this YouTube channel. So please do not forget to subscribe, like this video. It helps, it helps, does it help? We don't know. We don't know if it helps. And yeah, over the next uh, couple of months, I will be doing a lot of ski and snowboard content. So I will be testing this in real life um, action sports scenarios. Uh, November 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, one of those one of those days. We're doing some stuff with Craig McMorris, who's an incredible uh, Red Bull snowboarder. Uh, head on over to his page. He has been creating some amazing video content over the winter. So if you're in the ski and snowboard space, uh, we're going to be doing a lot of stuff together over the winter. So uh, yeah, that's all. See you next time. I guess we didn't talk about the shutter noise, did we? So that's a speaker. You're hearing a shutter noise. That's a speaker. Um, you can turn that off. Uh, maybe to close off, my favorite feature. So I was nervous. I was like, when I turn off all audible noise and I'm shooting in silent shutter mode, how do I know frames are actually going off? And within the settings, there's actually, uh, you can set up lines. So little lines appear whenever you're taking a photo. So every time you hit the shutter, and rather than there being a click, uh, you see some little lines just kind of pop up on each side so you know you have a visual confirmation. And I am super happy that they added that because, uh, yeah, I don't know. Incredible camera. See you next time. Probably on a snowboard hill or a mountain. Not sure what the differences are. I don't live here. You can go watch this video if you want. It's a nice one, I promise. Car's over here.